So, welcome to another uh, NAM Academy. So today we're going to talk about something we call the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. I'm not the uh, world's best artist, but I will just uh, sort of draw an elephant. So elephant in the room. So the the principle is the mind always creates a narrative to fill a vacuum addressing out the elephant in the room early so that's a little mysterious but I'll we'll go a little bit into what we mean by that so the elephant in the room is a western saying in the west we call elephant in the room what we mean by that is there's something big in the room and we can't ignore it. You, 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 you think of, you know, you're, you're here at home watching a video or you're, you're, you're sitting in this room, you're listening to me. And if there were a big gorilla or a big elephant there or a lion or a shed or a tiger or something, are you really going to pay attention to what I'm saying? No. Are you going to pay attention to what I say? Yeah, I'll rub their jowba, right? Yeah, like, uh, your, your attention yeah. will go over there. Yeah. I could say anything. I could be dancing. Your attention will be, is that elephant going to run into you? Is, uh, is the tiger going to eat you? Is that whatever... I'm saying to you, you not pay the attention to that. So the thing is, that's pretty obvious. If there were an elephant in the room, you would probably say, Dr. Gill, excuse me, sir, there's an elephant right over there. Maybe we should deal with that. Call the zoo before it derails the whole thing. You're not, because an el So this is a metaphor. The thing is, is elephant in the room is a metaphor. It's a metaphorical elephant in the room because whether there, even if there's no real elephant, if there's something that's so big, it pull your attention. It doesn't have to be a real elephant. It could be. It could. It could be that you have a big secret that's very relevant to the person you're speaking to. Big secret. You don't share it. You keep it, and your mind is all on that. It's all on. Should I share this or not? Should I talk about this or not? And this, when you're talking to someone and you're not paying attention, your mind is distracted as if there was an elephant in the room. So we all carry, we all carry an elephant. An elephant can be People, places, things, ideas, fantasies that we hold, expectations. It, I'll, I'll give an example of this. So what we do is we a, a, a guy the other day he came to me said to me oh dr gill my mind is going so fast all the time the mag de janda you know i told him hey if you want to stay at our sober living facility you can 
Um, uh, but your phone's got to come to us because uh, that's our policy. We keep someone's phone for at least two to four weeks, if not longer, until they're stable. Why do we do that? Because when we access a phone, we expose ourselves to people, places, things, and ideas that distract us. It creates the elephant in the room. And so whatever I say, dancing, whatever, you not pay attention, your attention is on the phone. Either, maybe you're not on the phone right now, but in your head, you're on the phone somewhere. You're, 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 who are you talking to? You know, if you're into pornography, you're, you're not, like, thinking about that, or if you argued with your wife, you're thinking about that. The more recent you expose to this, the bigger that idea, and the less time you have. So remember what we said, subconscious garbage can. Your consciousness only has enough space for let's just say five to 10 things can fit into consciousness. That's not a lot. So let's say 80% of your consciousness is filled with like, with, uh, you know, let's say 80% is filled with this elephant kind of stuff, you know, people, places, things, ideas. You only have this little, little space to listen to somebody. And how, why does this matter? Because I don't, I, if I'm another person, right? If I'm this person, I don't know what you're doing. All I know is you're not paying attention to me. If I'm some other person, right? I'm, I'm looking at you. I see you're distracted. You can tell when someone's distracted. You know when someone is distracted and you don't tell me why you're distracted. I know you're distracted. I know that your, your attention is somewhere else. So what do I do? I assume. This person assumes. And what do we assume? Assume is a good saying. Never assume because assuming makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> assume. Ass. You, me. Uh, anyway, that's just a it's, a... it's a good thing not to assume something about someone. But what we do, and the reason for that is, we always assume based on our program trauma patterns. So we assume, usually in the most negative light, and usually we say something like, he doesn't care. He's distracted because this isn't important. It reinforces this belief, which makes this person kind of upset. Which then make this person look at this person with this lens. He doesn't care. So you say, you don't care about me, you're this or that. And it just gets messier, you know, back and forth, back and forth. You know, this person gets upset because now you've said you don't care about me. Triggers more subconscious stuff coming up here. And then it just kind of keeps on going. This is your big fight. The whole problem is communication. This person who's distracted whose mind is full of all this junk, who has an elephant in the room, 
he has something in the room. Maybe it's not junk. Maybe it's important. Maybe his, his rent isn't paid by the end of the day. He's going to get kicked out. A lot of people feel shame about that. But if he doesn't tell that person, that person is just going to assume. That's what people do. People in recovery don't assume. Or, or, or they try not to. You should avoid it. Because you're probably wrong. Most people aren't in recovery. Most people assume. If you're, a, if you're a man and you're an addicted person, your wife, if you have a wife, she probably assumes lots of stuff about you. Some of it's good, most of it's not. So the thing is, is that the person who's in control of this is the person with the elephant who's distracted. He'd be better off saying, you know, a different world, he could say, hey, uh, I am distracted right now. Brother Jean, I am distracted right now. And the other person says, oh, what are you distracted about? I don't have a place to stay tonight. Oh, okay. So when I was telling you about my, 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 you know, how my, I don't know, uh, my tennis game wasn't working well, when I kind of, I can see why that wasn't really important to you, because you don't have a home. And instead of anger and upset and he doesn't care, it's going to be compassion. It's going to be, oh, okay, how can I help? So, a lot of times, what people have in their heads, you know, they're ashamed. They feel the shame. What's going on in their head? and they don't want to say it. What they forget, and I say this again and again, is communication is 99% nonverbal. Don't for one second think that you are a good enough liar to hide what you're really thinking. They may not know what you're thinking, but at some level they feel what you're feeling. And if it doesn't reflect what they see, they don't trust you. That's just how it is. And so if you're hiding something, you don't have to tell everybody your every little dirty secret. But if it's in your head and you're bothered by it, you can assume that they'll know something's not right. A, a lady just today, I kind of said to her, something doesn't seem quite right with you. And she didn't respond, but then a couple of minutes later, yeah, you know what, A, B, and C. It was out in the open. But if I'm not healthy in my head, I'm going to say something's not right. And I even felt it. I felt, is this about me? Because I'm human, I, I assume. But then she said, and then I was like, oh, okay, it's not about me. Or our relationship, it's her stuff. Oh, okay. So, the mind, in the absence of, in the absence of uh, information, The mind assumes the worst. That's human nature. Unless someone's in substantial recovery, their mind will assume the worst. 
A person who's been addicted to drugs and alcohol and gambling and bad behavior or anything like that, and their family has seen it for many years, they will assume the worst. That assumption is based on the best available data. Best available data is another way of saying the past. The best available data they have on you is that you cheat, lie, steal, do drugs, alcohol. The best available data you have on them is that they yell at you, they shame you, they, they make you feel like a terrible human being. They look in your mouth to smell, they dehumanize you. That's your past. Or that your parents did it or someone. And you assume they're going to do it to you. The disease is in the assumption and that's just the nature of the mind. So the mind, you know, vacuum, you know where the, the biggest vacuum in the world is in space. Vacuum, vacuum, vacuum means empty. But it doesn't just mean empty, every vacuum exerts the pressure. And so, if you have a vacuum cleaner, it creates negative pressure and the air outside rushes to fill it. Rushes. Because creation does not tolerate a vacuum. If there's nothing there, there's an... You know, if you, if you pass some gas right over there, Gas is of a nature, if you, if you, you know, Padmarna, you know, fart, it expands and it fills the room. There's no changing that. Every gas, it expands to fill the room. If there's smoke there, if in, given enough time, I will smell it over there. Why? Because it, everything expands to fill the space. That's the nature of the physical world. What I'm telling you is also the nature of your mental world. No vacuum is tolerated. The question is, if there's a absence of information, so absence of information is its own vacuum. When you don't know where your husband is at night, absence of information. This happens to us in our sober living place. I don't know where some of the, where the guys go sometimes. Absence of information leads me to think, hmm, what's going on? And I'm an addiction doctor, so I pretty much assume they realize. <laughs> Hey, it's just, it's how I am. It's what I know. And so sometimes I'm right. Most of the times I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. But the point is, is absence of information, if, if you go away, you don't answer the phone, you don't say anything, people will assume you're hurt or you're doing something bad. And then when you come back, they'll stress you the heck out. So a lot of times in these lectures, I always say like 95% of stress, of toxic stress is preventable. Because you live your life in a way where you avoid this situation. A person in recovery needs to avoid this. Where people don't know where they are, people don't know what they're doing, a person in recovery needs to learn to be very open because they've lived their life in such a way that people are always going to assume stuff about them 
usually for about one to three years at least after they get sober so the thing is absence of information creates stress that's why this matters so when you have something that's bothering you but you don't say it you're distract you're going to be distracted by it the other person will think you're just being a jerk that you think you're the only person important that's what that's actually you know what alcoholics uh, there uh, the one definition is as a pathological self-centeredness very rarely do we define an alcoholic in terms of what it really is which is a complex traumatic phenomenon oftentimes augmented with head injuries and other things we don't talk about it like that we just say it's a bad person doing bad things we simplify it we don't think of it as a person in suffering every addicted person i've ever met is a person in suffering for a long time that's why they drink so the thing is society doesn't know much about the alcoholic so there's an absence of information a vacuum vacuum of information and if they're wise they will think better this is why we like to work with families we like to tell them just because you don't know something doesn't mean it's always the worst and even if it is the worst it's okay because with love and time and compassion it'll get better we like to work with families to teach them that a person in recovery needs to know that they need to avoid this a person in recovery oftentimes this they complain to me they say my family always thinks i'm doing something wrong yeah it's because you did something wrong for 20 years 30 years you yell at your wife you argue you fight you you you, you get into trouble you make your bed and you got a lie in it this is what it is but don't make it worse by hiding your bank account don't make it worse by not telling people where you're going don't make it worse by further increasing the absence of information and that's the, one of the most key ways to live life a person who's in healthy recovery they this is in aa they say we are as sick as the secrets that we keep we are as sick as the secrets that we keep that's from aa why because they understand that secrets a big bad secret they know that the other person can detect it and they're going to assume the worst they're going to know he's not telling me something i don't know what and so then they're going to reflect on their past and in their past something bad usually is what happened and then they're going to project that on the person they're going to stress them out and they're going to go and drink or drug or do something but the fault is with the person who kept the secret what for the for example for the absence of hiding back so in the same hiding where is going so what was the third one I don't quite remember but I'll come back to it. So the thing is that absence of information is the biggest thing that you have to avoid if you want a healthy relationship. Over time trust builds. What is trust? Trust is a pattern of positive assumption. Trust equals pattern of positive and that's why it takes time to build trust is because trust positive assumption being completed yeah he was out 
I trusted that he wasn't doing anything bad and he came back sober on time. That's a positive assumption coming true, repeated again and again and again, becomes trust. And so you just need a lot of it. So a person in recovery, one to three years before their family begins to have enough positive experiences, you know, if you think that you just come to a recovery class, you come to NOM or you go to some treatment center and you're rehabilitated, no, it's not how it works. You have to live your life in such a way that you have a pattern of positive behavior, which over time will, in, will bring the trust. And when you got the trust, then over time, the stress goes down. The stress goes way down. And so the thing is that the elephant in the room, so to summarize, is the people, places, and things, and ideas, fantasies that are in your head that you're not telling that you're distracted by, that are filling your conscious space. Everyone knows because communication is non-verbal, 99%. But they don't know, they don't, they know something's wrong, they don't know what. They assume the worst. It creates stress. And that drives a cycle of relapse. And the solution is no elephant in the room. As soon as an elephant comes, I'm upset. I don't know why, but I'm upset. That's healthy communication. You don't need to know why you're upset. The other person needs to know that you're upset. And if you tell them that you're upset, they're more likely to join you in helping you. They're more likely to be understanding when you raise your voice. But if you don't tell them you're upset, they're going to assume you're upset at them. And that's going to create an argument and stress. And people, you live your life this way, it's going to disturb your sleep and it's going to keep you sort of trapped in this pattern of being. So I say, avoid elephants in the room by talking about them. As soon as you talk about them, everyone knows. Instead of becoming your enemy, they become your friend. If it's not about that person, or even if it is, you tell them what's in your heart, that you're feeling bad about something, that's why you're distracted, I'm going to be homeless tonight. You take the, you take the vacuum away. The vacuum goes away and so too does your stress. And a lot of times, your, the answer comes. A solution comes. So, in a lot of recovery, they say don't try to do anything alone. Sometimes you can't tell that you have something on your head. So it helps to have like a friend, someone you can talk to, who can say, hey, you don't look 100%. What's wrong? Elephant in the room, talk about it, don't ever, I, even if it makes you awkward in a conversation, hey uh, Bob, I, I'd love to talk but there's a horrible smell happening right now, I can't ignore it. Oh sorry, it's just, uh, 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 let's change, let's, let's go to a different room, is what Bob's going to say. Rather than stewing over it, thinking it's going to go away, it's not. It's just going to get bigger. And that person's going to know. You're not going to win. Better off, just say, hey, there's a horrible smell. Maybe that person had a, he, he passed some gas. Yeah. If, if you talk about it, 
It may not be comfortable. It may be something your parents told you never to do. But you know what? Parents can be wrong. And they're definitely wrong about that. Talk about the elephant in the room. Don't just play along to get along. Be assertive. If you if there's something in your mind that's just not going and you're trying to talk to someone, either tell them, hey, just like I did with that person on the phone, hey, I have a meeting. I can't talk to you right now. I'll call you back. Better that than me listening to him half with my mind and setting this thing up and that's not going to be good. He's not going to be happy and then you're not going to be happy. No one's happy. Better you tell him, you're going to handle that later and then you can handle this now. You have to restructure how you live your life. You know, people in my life probably think I'm really weird. They do. They think I'm very strange. Because I, if I notice something, I just say it. Even if it's inappropriate in their mind that I should just kind of ignore. I will never ignore an elephant in the room. You look upset. Let's talk about that. Because whatever we're, whatever we're supposed to talk about, 99% will be lost and it will be a waste of time unless we either get you not upset or at least until we understand why you're upset. If you're upset at me, then you're definitely not going to listen to anything we talk about. Get it out. You'll destroy the vacuum. You'll fill it with your positive stuff. You know, there's a saying in the West, the first impression is the last impression. You heard that? First impression? It's the last impression. What they mean by that is that your first impression is your first opportunity to fill this with positive. If you can fill it with positive, much less likelihood of negative, because now you filled it with something. So when it's empty, you put something positive in the mind of someone else, they're less likely to go fishing for negative. So if you're running late, right? You're running late for a meeting. You send a text saying, hey, I'm going to be 20 minutes late. Versus they're sitting there waiting for 20 minutes and then you show up. Now they've had 20 minutes to think about you and why you're not there. And they're going to go to the negative. But if you give them in advance, hey, I'm late today. Memorial Drive was closed because of the flooding. Oh, okay. You have to learn, this is how you restructure relationships. So I think that's all I'll say on the elephant in the room and filling the, the uh, addressing the elephant in the room. Lots more I can say. I'm just gonna uh, just uh, hands up if you have some comments or questions. Okay, good. We'll go uh, over there first and then we'll go over there second. So go ahead. So, Dr. Joe, I'm, I'm just wondering about this elephant in the room. Now that I'm in recovery, I can usually identify the elephant in the room for myself and don't have a problem talking about it. But before recovery, the elephant in the room for me often was I wanted to be somewhere else because I needed to get my next fix. I needed to have my, my, my drugs. Um, so if that's my elephant in the room, how am I supposed to bring that up to, to the other person who I've been hiding my addiction from for years and and and, and, and trying to be, you know, sitting, just be very um, secretive about it. Um, so if that's the elephant in the room, is it's like, how, how do you bring that up? I, I, mean, I never did and and I can't imagine that I, that I would. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question, right? Do you tell everyone in the world all your secrets? Uh, there's, there's people that do need to know. There's some people that don't need to know. Lots of people don't need to know lots of stuff. Some people need to know things. So the elephant in the room <laughs> needs to be addressed. One way or the other. So if you're addicted to drugs and you don't want that person to know, you got to deal with that problem. So some people will need to know. If it's your doctor who's going to prescribe you the meds, 
to help you to, you know, get off or something, you're going to be better off telling them. And it's going to be uncomfortable, especially if you've hit it for a long time. Uh, or some doctor. But if it's someone at work who just knows you're distracted, well, don't leave it like that. You, you're better off telling them the truth with less detail. I got something going on. I can't tell you about it, but it's just, I'm distracted. I'm sorry. Who doesn't have something going on? Everyone has problems. Yes. There's no shame in having problems. No one in the world I've ever met doesn't have problems. But the thing, but we don't do that. You never did that, did you? You just hide. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. Just show up late for work every day. Just half-baked this or that. Your work sucks. Your home life. You're not committed. You're you're doing this and you're doing that. Everyone knows. Every you know what? As an addiction doctor, I, I get these guys coming in. You're usually they're guys because men are have a lower EQ than, than women. Uh, they they they. No one knows. <laughs> everyone knows. Usually, the vast majority of people. Everyone knows long before they ever tell anybody. Because communication is 99% nonverbal, and the more inebriated you are, the more drunk and stuff, the less contained you can be about what's going on. So, basically, people know that there's something up. If you tell them there's something up, they know that you know, and that you're going to get help. And as long as they know that you're getting help, they don't need to know the details. But everyone needs to know that there's a reason for this not so good way of being. There's a reason for why you're this or that all the time, late or performing poorly. They just need to know that you're doing something about it. The more close they are, if it's a wife of a husband who's an alcoholic, you know, and there's no messy divorce or something going on, you know, you're, there's less tension if you just let it out and just speak open and honest. That's why they say in AA, we are as sick as the secrets that we keep, and as we recover, honestly, you can ask me anything about anything in life. I'll tell you. My, be a little awkward if you want to ask me about certain things, but there's no shame in any of it. I'm a human. We all are, and we all have things. So that's my answer: is not everyone needs to know every one thing about you, but if they if they know you're distracted, you're better off calling it out, saying, "I'm just, just so you know, I'm distracted. Just so you know, I got something going on. I'm trying my best to address it. If I can't, I'll let you know." Every boss would love to hear that. Chances are you won't get fired as quickly. Chances are you'll get some compassion. Maybe they'll even, heck, you know what? A lot of bosses are alcoholics in recovery. And so you say, hey, I'm struggling with alcohol. You never know if your boss is a person in recovery. Then all of a sudden you have no bigger ally. They'll help you, they'll cover for you, they'll support you, they'll take you under their wing. Because they know. So magical things happen. And I'm not saying tell your boss about everything about you, but... Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. You don't have to say it all. But don't say nothing. <laughs> if you're actually, you got a big problem in your head and you can't stop thinking about it, don't say nothing because they're gonna assume the worst about you. And then they're gonna tell their friends or your family members and it's gonna spread and you're gonna start feeling pressure. That's why I say 99, 95% of toxic stress is preventable. We know it's coming. We're creating it or we know it's coming. You take on a job that's too much for you. You did it. So that's that's kind of the thing. Other questions, comments 
on the on the on the online. Okay, go ahead. So it's like means the elephant in the room. We also can see that we can eat elephant from one side slowly and then we don't think take rush because elephant is a big animal. So it's like through a big problem you can start from one side. So keep slowly fighting and clean it. And also thing I in my life I always try to share my all my problem with my family with my family, everything. But they all have been all before that. My mother always said, "Just listen, do your work, and don't reply." But now my mother didn't say that thing. But she showing me. She just doing her her work, never reply anything. And I just and saying so, everything. So what? So uh, I, th I think the comment then. How can I fix it? Uh, it's not enough. So, so what the question we had over here was, I got a problem. I'm not going to tell everyone about my drug addiction issue. What do I tell them? Mm. The answer is, is telling them something's going on when they can obviously see something's going on will help. Mm. But that's not the only thing to tell them. <laughs> Are you doing something about it? Yeah, I tell everything. Telling is very different than doing. Mm -hmm. People are not dumb. Mm -hmm. In fact, I meet very few addicted, not addicted, mentally ill, healthy. No one's dumb. Yeah. Nobody is an idiot. And so the thing is, is um, if what you're doing mm -hmm. is not creating the trust, mm -hmm. then your words are not matching your actions. That's what lack of trust is. And you can tell them everything you're doing, but it's not going to work. If recovery is about peace, if, if we are becoming peaceful, if our life is becoming peaceful, our family life will calm down. Very, very rare do I encounter a family in fact, it's never happened. Where, when people become calm in a healthy way, especially the person with the addiction, everyone gets calm. And if that's not what's happening, chances are your 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 walking and your talking are not aligned. You're saying one thing, you're doing another, and that's going to make it worse. That's going to be like putting gasoline in the fire because <laughs> it's like uh, Dr. Gill is like, I'm eating my chips. Hey, don't eat chips. It's bad for you. Mm. Yeah. It's horrible for you. Yeah. Oh, you, you know what? I'll eat your chips. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. annoying. Right. There's nothing yeah. more annoying. It's better if you don't eat anything and yes. you don't let them eat anything. But eating... And telling them not to eat is the worst, most annoying thing you can do. Yeah, right. But that's what you're doing. You're I telling mean, them about all of the stuff you're doing. Yeah. But you're not walking the walk. Because if you were, things would get calm. Mm. Is generally how it works. Every situation is different. So I'm just saying, authentic recovery from the heart has a very cooling effect on everyone. Fake recovery or recovery that's inauthentic or distracted recovery where you're on your phone all the time will actually bother your family more because you know they'll, they'll think he's not doing anything. So we can talk more about that later but I, 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 I wanted to put that comment out there. Yeah, well, thank you. Any other comments other than you? Yes. Uh, Dr. Bill, after recovery, as I mentioned to you that I relapsed um, two, three days and then it took me about 12 hours to come back when I consider my whole recovery cycle. But what I, a realization in an IOP you should throw tons of 
thing on your uh, patient. When mind is not normal, or many bad thoughts in your conscious brain take up, and when you are sober or becoming sober, automatically they go up. Is that right or not? That's absolutely right, and I'll show you why. I'm going to draw it here. And this goes to your question. So this is a big eye, okay? This is an eye. Mm -hmm. When we are not in recovery, you know, there's something that people do, especially addicts, there's a reason why they're called pathologically self-centered. The mind, when it's unhealthy, yes. is coated with all this garbage that makes us see all that is bad, makes us see something good, so a person can be good. A person that is good will be seen as bad. When our mind is not clean, yes. we it, it coats our eyes and everything we see becomes filtered through that bad lens. Okay. And so you can't help it. You can only find a fault in everything. In AA, they say this all the time. I could not help but find fault in everything. Everything, anything ever, anyone ever did was because they're bad. I'm good. But it, the problem is, is the mind, the subconscious garbage, is so layering over the eyes that you just see the bad in everyone. You become pessimistic. You... You, even if they do something good, you see it bad. You, you, you criticize. Yes, you, yeah. A lot of times, the, the, the alcoholic will, will uh, their kids, they'll say this thing. They'll say, you know what, dad never, um, he never saw the true good of what I was doing. Because mm. he was distracted. If he was distracted with all his garbage, he could not see it. If, you're, if, if garbage is over your eyes, you're going to see in a filthy, foul way everything, the good and the bad. It's not a real sense of reality. And so recovery is when we sort of take this off, layer by layer. Yes. And it doesn't happen quick, but we start taking this off, and we restore a situation where the eye is clean. And so all of a sudden, problems are, are, that were previously unsolvable become solvable. Things, solutions that we could not see become seen. A lot of people say, wow, I'm so thankful I'm an alcoholic. They say this. I'm so thankful I'm an alcoholic because now I can see the good in my family. I can see the good in my wife. But when your eyes are overlaid with all this garbage, and reinforced with all the media, you can't help but be critical because that's what you're seeing. You're not wrong. For what you're seeing, you're not wrong. That's where my compassion comes from. Mm -hmm. I don't think of an addict as bad, but I know what's going on, and so their judgments are inaccurate. They're not true most of the time until they get deeper and deeper into recovery. Thank you. I have a comment on this. On this last comment, uh, and then we're going to say what I am seeing. I am seeing in my family's ego problem. No one want to like take his responsibility. Like they doing something wrong. Any single thing happened in the home, anything they just blame on me. If anything small, big, or children, any anything happened, they just only blame on me. Yeah. I think it's an ego problem in every everyone. They don't want. And uh, you, that's I'm thinking, I don't know. And you can't control them? Yeah, I don't control them. I just like uh, that. No, I, I don't know yeah. if that's true or not, but... Yeah. 
You can only control yourself. You can yeah. only do this in yourself. Mm. And if you do, you'll find your family comes along in a year or three. Mm. Okay. Yes. Mm. Not, not tomorrow. Yeah, like if you're that. like this, they become like this looking at you. Mm. Yeah. And guess what? Their thing is not going to go away until your thing goes away. You clear yours, and then after one to three years, they'll start clearing theirs. Yeah. Even they do something and wrong. So, thank you, they, G. They don't accept it. I don't think you're necessarily yeah. hearing everything I'm saying. Well, that's okay, that's recovery. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you. It's been a bit of a longer session, but it's yes, a good one. Important subject. Yes, subject. Thank you so much, very much. Very good.